and welcome, welcome to Rhino Inside Revit course, where I'm going to, well, be teaching you the basics of Rhino Inside Revit. So, first of all, what is it, right? What do we use it for? Well, historically speaking, um, if you wanted to export stuff from Rhino, let's say something, you know, some sort of a more complex facade system or some sort of fa fancy shape, you would have used something that is called an STEP file format, which basically transfers NURBS geometry from one software to the other, like, you know, so you just export a file, you import the file in Revit. The problem with that was that a bunch of information that might have been associated with the geometry, like materials, um, like family names, the name of the geometry itself, and, and so on, yada yada, all of that would have been lost in the process. So people in McNeil, the creators of Rhino, have came up with this plugin, which works mostly through Grasshopper. And this plugin enables you to um, export the geometry from Rhino into Revit while retaining some amount of information. It's very, very nice. Uh, also, by the way, it works backwards or other way around. So you can get stuff from uh, Revit back into Rhino uh, through the same plugin. I should note that I am expecting the viewers of this video to know the basics of Rhino as well as the basics of Revit. Um, you, if you know the basics of Grasshopper, that's even better because we are going to be indeed using Grasshopper for this, but if you don't, that's fine. I will guide you through it. Just keep in mind that this is not going to be aimed at showcasing the um, how do you make fancy designs with Grasshopper. It's going to be aimed, this whole course is going to be aimed at showcasing the workflow from Rhino into Revit. How do you construct a proper workflow when using this particular plugin. Okay, I guess it's time to actually uh, start kind of creating things. So let's jump to it. Okay, so let's start with a clean slate. So I'm just going to be creating a new file in Revit. And by the way, we are starting with Revit. A new file. And for the template, I'll just choose metric architectural template. There we go. Like that. Hit OK. We're good to go. So let's just wait for it to load in. And now, as per usual, with the new template, we have our levels, we have our site uh, to ceiling plans, and four elevations. I don't really care for the elevations, so I'm just going to be deleting them immediately, as well as for the ceiling plans. And we probably don't really need level one and level two. So I'm just going, actually, I'm just going to get rid of level two. I'm just selecting them and deleting them. Here, um, I'll, I'll keep level one. We might, we might just kind of change the, the height of it. We'll see, we'll see. But the important part is that now, after installing Rhino Inside Revit plugin, we have this tab right here, Rhino Inside. And in it, we have, well, currently we only have the start button. This kind of starts running the plugin. So let's click it. And it's going to slowly start loading it all in. Okay. This is fine. Come on, that's V-Ray. So that's the rendering plugin that's... that's um, being being a nuisance. A sh a keyboard shortcut R is now assigned to Rhino. That's fine. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. I'm by the way just uh, reinstalled Revit, and just so that we have um, the same experience you and I. Um, that that's why it kind of gives me so many questions. Usually, uh, once you have approved all of it, the next time you load it in, it won't ask the same questions over and over, and it won't give you the same errors over and over again. At least that was my experience. Either way, now when the plugin has started, all of these uh, icons are available to you. And I guess the, what, the, the way I should expl explain it is that currently inside of Revit, you can just start Rhino. And that's what we're go going to be doing right now. So when I click the Rhino icon, 
it starts an instance of Rhino in which I can start kind of modeling. This is like a 100% just a Rhino model, right? So I can do 5,000 by 5,000 by 5,000, like five by five by five meter box. It will not show up in Revit, of course, because currently these are uh, not linked. They are going to get linked through Grasshopper. So whatever I do here in Rhino will not automatically transfer into Revit, if that was your hope. Um, that, no, that's not going to be the case. Um, without any more blah blah blah, I think we should kind of just start working and I'll explain things as we go, right? So the first thing for any project is to actually get the, you know, the site in. And I can choose to either get a site uh, directly into Revit or I can choose to get it into Rhino. And I personally prefer to work with the site in Rhino. So that's where we're going to be importing it. And I will be using um, prepared site right here, AADA20 site. If you want to use the same model, it's in the video description, download link, blah, blah, blah. By the way, all of the finalized models are going to be available for the Patreon supporters. So if you would like those, consider supporting the channel. Also, link in the video description. With that out of the way, I'm just going to drag in the uh, AADA20 site 3dm and I'll just choose to import the file not to open to import hit OK and it just kind of gets imported right here again no correlation between Rhino and Revit just yet so with this imported um, if I show you the layers you can see we have the buildings layer in blue we have the hatch layer in black we have the land layer, which is basically all of the lines, and we have the site layer, which is in red. So this is our little site in which we're going to be working in. By the way, this is Malmo uh, in Sweden, for those who are curious. First thing to do is to kind of... I don't want my site to be so way off from 000, which is right here, right? This is our start of the world. I don't want it to be so off, so I'm just going to move everything onto this point. So I'm just going to unlock all of these layers, make sure that all of them are unlocked, select everything, move, enter, M, enter, and let's just say this point right here, well, I do need to enable the end point snapping here in the bottom left. This point right here, right, I click on it, it's going to be zero. So when you type in zero for a move, it just automatically moves it to zero, zero, zero coordinates like that. And I think that's, that's kind of it. I, mm, perhaps the hatch is a little bit too much. So I'm just going to delete the hatch. Uh, we don't really need it because we do have a curve here. Okay. Let's lock all of this up and let's see. Um, do we start designing or do I show you how to import stuff into Revit or transfer stuff? Well, let me show you how to transfer um, and let's do something very simple. Let's uh, transfer just this boundary line or boundary curve from Rhino into Revit automatically. So for that, we will need Grasshopper. You can either type in Grasshopper here in the command line or you can go back into Revit and for some reason it's going to complain a little bit so there we go now it's fine um, and you just click on the grasshopper icon right here and you're just going to load in the a, a grasshopper window for you at this point you might start thinking hmm perhaps two screens would be a good idea and yes working with rhino inside revit and using two screens would be definitely a uh, a good idea because <laughs> it gets cramped uh, quite quickly so this curve needs to arrive here um, first of all we need to reference in this curve right so I'll just double click anywhere in my grasshopper screen anywhere and I will link this curve into grasshopper all right right so I need to double click and type in curve 
And this little black hexagon here, uh, the black hexagon icon, means that it's just an empty container, not curve element by the way, that's for Rhino's native, or no, sorry, Revit's native curves. No, we don't use that, the black one. Um, it's an empty container that will be waiting for us to give it a reference of a curve. So I click that. Now we have this, by the way, let me just do this real quick. You don't need to, uh, don't worry about this. This doesn't exist for you. It just enables me to show you the name of the node. Uh, so that, that should be a little bit more helpful. And basically now I need to link this curve right here that is locked. Let's not have it locked. I'm unlocking the site layer. So selecting this curve and linking it to the node right here. Right click the node and choose set one curve. Right? And now, if I unselect everything, right, and I click on the node, when the node is selected, the curve here is also selected. It turns green, right? So currently, um, this node references this curve in grass, oh, in Rhino. This grasshopper node references this curve in Rhino. They are linked. So now I need to transfer this linked curve into Revit. How do I do that? Well, after you've installed uh, Rhino inside Revit, uh, it also installs like a small add-on or not a small, a, an add-on, a tab in um, Grasshopper. And this is the tab, it's called Revit, right? And it has so many tools here that if I were to try and explain every single one of them, I think you would get way too overwhelmed. So we're just going to be going at it one step at a time, right? So I will just explaining the things that I use, right? And uh, we will j just, we will not be covering every single tool in this course, only the ones that are going to be used for this workflow, if that makes sense. So we need to get a curve into Revit. I go to build, it's not build, I go to direct sh shape tab, and I choose to add curve direct shape, right? And if I uh, just hover my mouse over the selection here, it says given a curve, it adds a curve shape to the active Revit document exactly what we need. So I choose this, click here, add curve, direct shape, shape, and I just connect these two. What happens? Well, now in Revit, I have my curve, right? If I select it, you can see that it's pinned, meaning that, well, it, uh, Rhino has position over it and I can't really change it. I can technically unpin it and, and then start moving it around. And now, you know, the relationship between these two break. But I think if I were to... Let's move it in Rhino to somewhere here. Yeah, now you can see that this, this is starting to get um, broken. Quite broken down quite a bit. So please don't unpin things. Right, so let's undo here um, and undo here. And then if, if, if you want to, uh, if you messed it up and you can, you can see that it's still, you know, uh, bad, you can always click on recompute right here for the inside of Revit. Recompute and these get linked up again, right? So even if I, I let's test this out. If I just drag it off, now these are not in the same place. I recompute. Never mind. This is complaining now. Highlighted elements were not updated because they are unpinned. Right? So I think if I pin this and I recompute, then it gets updated. So keep in mind, don't unpin things if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Either way, we have our site boundary in here. That's great. And now I think um, you, you start getting the idea of how things will transfer. And I can just select this, click my scroll wheel and choose to group these two. And I'll just right click on them, uh, on the group. And I'll just say uh, landscape bound boundary. 
like that. Landscape boundary. Just so that we know what, what it does. Okay. So next, 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 we have, well, I guess it's time to create a form, right? So the form of our building, what do we want to do? Well, first of all, we want to definitely work. Uh, we won't need grasshopper for this, so I'm just going to minimize it. Uh, we will be working with Rhino um, here, and we'll be creating some sort of a swoopy, swoopy building. Uh, question is, how long? By the way, the both Rhino and Revit always work in millimeters. Uh, let's go for distance. Let's check. Okay, it's 96 meters uh, from these two points. And let me, by the way, lock the site so that I don't accidentally drag it around. Uh, that would be bad. <laughs> and actually, uh, currently, do we really care about the surroundings? Maybe a little bit here, but yeah, sure. Let, let, let's keep them. So in the top view, I'm just going to draw probably just a vertical line Let, let's go for that and i'll just say 90 meters so 90,000 millimeters something like this so almost the full length maybe 90 meters was too much let me just draw a line that's 80 meters yeah 80 meters seems to be a little bit more you know slightly more reasonable than whatever we had before uh, 90 so I have this line right here um, it only has two control points the endpoints right so we can't really twist it so I'll just rebuild it rebuild 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 it with um, let's say four point point count four degree three so degree one is a polyline sharp corners degree two are basically arcs that are chained together degree three is a soft nerves curve so that delete and put yes and we just hit okay right so now we have four control points by the way if you can't see the control points hit f10 or you can type in points on as well it's going to show you the control points and then what do we do perhaps we Perhaps I just kind of take these two points and just move them. Move them to the side like so. By how much? Let's say 17 meters. Mm -hmm. That starts looking promising. And then let's say these two kind of want to have more control points honestly okay plan b plan b what if we say what if we rebuild this again still four points but degree one and bear with me degree one so it's a polyline right i still select these i still move them by 17 meters like that but now I take the control point curve and I use the midpoint snap here to actually snap to endpoint, to midpoint, to endpoint, to midpoint, endpoint, midpoint, endpoint. So here you can really easily see where, where I clicked, right? And I, then I hit enter. What this does, it basically creates a much more aggressive turn because now we have um, these three points creating a corner rather than before we had one to these three points creating a curve corner, right? So it's it's a more of an aggressive turn. And then I can do an offset. Uh, let's say it's loose and let's say the distance is 25 meters. Let's just see. <clears throat> I don't like that. I think that looks a little bit yucky. Maybe. Like that control point right there. It's not great. So 
I could just delete that control point and now it looks a bit better. But I'm thinking of just taking this and instead of... Where's my gumball? <clears throat> instead of just uh, offsetting it, just simply moving it. Let's say 25 meters, something like that. Yes, it's going to be a little bit more narrow here. But perhaps that's not that big of a that big of a deal. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Either way, that's going to be our our footprint of the building. I'm I'm still thinking about the, the footprint and about this being um, smaller of a gap compared to this and this. Perhaps there's there's a better way, and that 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 better way is if I undo. And I still have the pole line. What if we offset the pole line here, like that, with 25, and we use the same technique on the new newly offsetted pole line, like so? Yeah, that's that's much better. I, I think that that looks much better. So we're going to be uh, we're going to be definitely using this, uh, perhaps. Just one, one last thing, bear with me, please. <laughs> Offset 20 rather than 25, because it's, uh, it's quite, of a, quite a fat boy. So let's do 20 meters. A little bit more elegant, you know. So we're using end, uh, midpoints to make sharper turns. Okay, I think that's, that's that. Now, um, I don't want all of it to be um, in the same length or in the same height right i want uh, some parts of it to be raised up and i'm thinking this area right here let's see the entrance is going to be through here right and basically all of this will be a cantilever so i'm just going to hit f10 and i'm just going to select the sorry select the these six points right here and just move them up by six meters 6,000 millimeters, <clears throat> like that. So now I have one, two, three points uh, up by six meters and um, the, the remaining ones are resting on the ground, right? And the transition basically happens where the curve happens, which is, um, I think, important. So let's, let's think then for the top, hmm. Well, for the top, I could just kind of... I, I have my notes here. One second. Um, for the top, I could just take these and copy them up by 16 meters. So I'm holding the Alt key <clears throat> when I click the arrow, the gumball arrow. And I just copy them up by 16 meters. Like this. Like so. And this is the moment where the surrounding buildings are starting to kind of... Um, be annoying so I'm just going to disable them like that so that we're, we're kind of clean in the way we work so something like this <clears throat> does this work I think this should work right this feels like it should work okay so that and perhaps Well, for now, let, let's leave it leave it like so. Let's build a model in Grasshopper from these four just to see how they how they work. So, back in Grasshopper, by the way, if you can't find Grasshopper, if you minimized it, usually it's in the bottom left corner of your uh, screen uh, of your Rhino model. If you still can't find Grasshopper, click the Grasshopper button here. If that doesn't work, type in Grasshopper into your Rhino, it's going to open up. And it's going to show you the original file on which you worked. So, these curves. I will double click and curve again. Create the same curve component. Because we're going to be referencing them again. And this time I'm going to... I'm not, I don't have anything selected in Rhino. I'm going to right click on the curve component. Choose to set multiple curves. And I'm just going to select them either clockwise or counterclockwise, right? Uh, you can't have them selected randomly. So let's go counterclockwise. It doesn't really matter. So that, that, and that. 
enter. So I'm just click, 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 right? Uh, and then I hit enter. I have four curves here. You can see that when I select this, they are there. And I can now loft them. Loft. Like that. And it makes quite a quite an ugly shape, I think. Like a very yeah, not 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 so nice shape. Uh, so we'll need to work on this a little bit to make it you know make it worthwhile. Uh, first of all, um, I think the angle, the turns that it, the loft needs to make through the curves are too aggressive. So we need to change the type of the loft from normal to loose. Two ways to do it. First way, right clicking the options of the loft input and choosing loft options. And here, instead of normal, choosing loose. Or if you want to kind of see it better, you can just type in loft options like so. Connect it like that. And then here, the last input is the type where you can see that 0 is normal, 1 is loose, 2 is tight, 3 is straight, 5 is uniform. Where is 4? The hell happened to 4? Oh, doesn't matter. <laughs> so 1 is loose. So here we just kind of type in 1. Uh, by the way, I create a slider with one. Uh, if you want it more compact, you can just type in slash slash one. That creates a panel with number one. If you just uh, double click and type in one, it, it will create a slider, which takes up more space. If you're creating really large uh, definitions, grasshopper definitions, you kind of want to save space, so you just use a panel. Uh, both of them will do exactly the same thing either way. I'm just going to be using a panel for this. So you can see now, now, it gets a little bit weird, right? Uh, these curves are being used like control points almost um, for the surface, which means that they're just suggestive of, um, of where the surface should interpolate itself through, right? So we need to either have more of them or change the loft type. I don't want to change the loft type because the normal one was too aggressive and that's the, you know, that's what's considered normal. So I, I do need to work with the loose loft. How do we make them interpolate stronger or better? Well, for instance, for example, if I tween, tween curves, T -d uh, T W E E N tween curves, and I tween between these two, like so. Enter. I get a third one, right? So now, if I were to right-click on this curve component and choose to clear values, so we clean the slate, and I right-click on on it again, and I choose to set multiple curves, and I click, 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 click. Now with the third one. You can see that it forces, or it doesn't really force it, but the way it's calculated kind of makes it so that the center of this loft goes through the tweened curve that we made, right? And we can we can quite use that to our um, our advantage, I think. So what can we do with it? Well, again, I'm, I'm checking the notes. Bear with me one second. The notes are basically by how how much do I move the control points. For example, let's minimize that. The these three points right here, we might want to introduce more complexity to the shape. So I can just take these three points of the low end of the building, center and low, right, uh, end of the building, and I can just move them up by. Uh, was it six meters? Something like that. Six meters. Kablamo, right? So now we have this kind of a funky shape going on, which, uh, trust me, it's, it's going to look nice eventually. Eventually. <laughs> Not right now, but eventually it's going to gonna look just fine. So we, we have this shape going on. Then we can uh, say that, well, actually, I want the... What's the word... I want the the corners to be more aggressive in the turn, right? To be sharper with the turn, but I don't want over over 
um, to overturn, if that makes sense. Um, I, I want them to be a little bit less blobby. Uh, that that might be the closest, <laughs> yeah, closest thing to an explanation that I can give you. So between these two curves, if I just say tween curves, and instead of one curve here, I can choose the number and I can say six, for example. It might not be six, I'll be using six, maybe we'll, we'll change it to something else. And now let's clear values and just this is just going to be to show so you don't need to repeat this this part but if i were to say you know every single curve here needs to be uh, lofted and these loose ones are lofted you can see how controlled it is right here and how fast it loses control and how soft it gets here right so that means the closer the curves are to each other the more they are kind of controlling the loft great clear values we don't need most of these right we only need like one here and one here and honestly all you could do is just kind of copy the bottom up and the top down and you will get the same same result it's just that i'm used to tweening the curves so i'm just going to be doing that and just deleting so we have two here two here to here to here and one here that should make the the corners a little bit more um a little bit more aggressive let's check set multiple one two three four five six seven eight and nine blammo we have ourselves definitely something that i would consider to be a much more aggressive of a bend and I think that's fine I, I think that looks that looks good um, then the verticality of it might be a little bit boring so I'm just going to take hmm, I guess I'm just going to take like these two curves for for instance and just move them out so minus 5,000 like out by five meters something like that just to kind of whoop make it uh, bend out like so might be cool might not be cool if you don't want the whole thing to bend out maybe you want like let's see this area to be controlled and this is just me freestyling <laughs> uh, you can just take these six control points and move them back by 5000 so only only this area tilts while this one stays uh, vertical perfectly vertical and you end up with something like this, right? So you have yourself a little loft. Well, okay. Now what? Let's say, and we will not be using this. Uh, just, just bear in mind. We, well, we will be using this, but we will not be using. Um, what's 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 the word? The form that we're going to be currently creating, we will not be using that form precisely in revit but i'll show you still how to import it you know if you want this inside of revit well first of all it needs to be closed a closed curve so we need the surface right here like we need the surface right and also we need the end caps so how do we do that in grasshopper well we already have one loft here through all of these curves and we need to make a surface right here so how do we get a loft between the first curve of within our little list right here and the last curve well uh, there's a note for that that's called list item list item and with this one, you'll just need to trust me. When you connect your curves to the list item input, it will always give you the first item of the list, which is this curve. How do you get the last one? Well, you could reverse the list and get the first item of the list. That's one way. Or you could just go into list item and click this plus sign right here that says, when, once you click it, it says minus one. Not the bottom one, the top one. So now minus one, 
means that it goes backwards in the list and gives you the last item of the list. Because the list is wrapped, it's kind of infinite, don't worry about it. So you have like uh, your last curve right here, you have your first curve right here, and you can loft. You can loft those two. And since they are just two curves, you don't really need options for lofting, you just get a loft. Right, so now you have two lofts. That's cool and all. How do you join them up? Well, you need to push them into one list and you can do that with merge. Merge. And just connect uh, D1 and D2 into merge. Uh, it will automatically give you D3. Or loft to D1, loft to D2. It will automatically give you D3. You don't need D3 so you can zoom in and click the minus sign here to get rid of it. So after merging, if you hover your mouse over, over the result, the R output, you might see that it, um, it's a little bit, it might be a little bit messy. In this case, it's not. And if it's not, we don't solve it. <laughs> I'm thinking if I should explain any further. I'll, I'll explain it this way. If something doesn't work after you've merged things, Try right-clicking the merge uh, output and choosing flatten. But in this case, we don't need to do it. And I'll try to catch a moment where merge kind of doesn't work as planned. And then I'll, I'll show you. So, but that's later. That's probably going to be in video number two. Either way, now our two surfaces are, or two B-reps, boundary representations are inside of um, a single merge component and then we can use brep join to join them up into one um, loop. Why do we not just make a closed loft you ask? Well, oh by the way I, I should, before that, I should kind of explain what I just did here. Notice how I just selected all of these except the brep join and then I click the scroll wheel and choose this blindfolded guy. Right? This icon means that the display of things will be hidden in the in the preview, in the grasshopper, uh, or, sorry, in the rhino preview. Um, right, why don't we loft? Why don't we loft uh, the, all of the curves into a closed loft? Well, because we want the bottom to be super sharp and also for uh, our paneling of the surface we will not be using the bottom of the curve or, or, or of, of the form we'll only be using the top shell right so the bottom will be dis discarded we'll only be using this uh, this portion of the shell right uh, so that's it's basically me preparing for the for the future but we do have our B-Rep. The problem is that it still has, you know, the front and the back hole in it. But since the holes are flat, and by flat I mean um, these boundary curves are planar, this and this, we can just use cap. Cap holes and just caps it. And we have ourselves a form. Yay! Now... One thing that I didn't really talk about that much was how do you show this without actually transferring all of the information into Revit? Well, back in Revit, if I want to see this, I can just click this shaded button right here and it will show me, well, this is the wrong later. This, uh, that, that was level one, so it's clipping through it. But uh, site plan uh, shows me where it is. And back here, I can... Come on, give it to me. There we go. Back here, I can kind of move it into position wherever I want. And you can see that it updates automatically. This is nice. This is useful. Because I can... Before actually linking them, I can kind of find like a ni nice, nice position for them. Uh, then let's create a 3D view. So back in Revit, I'll go to view, 
and I'll just choose 3D view like that. Perfect. A little snail thing, object, and we can have it here. If you actually want it to be imported into Revit as this kind of a shell, well, you would need to use a direct shape tab again for Grasshopper Revit. Um, and here you choose add geometry direct shape. You can also add BRIP. I don't remember how that works. Let's see. Okay, that, that was easy. Uh, now here it kind of overlaps um, a little bit, so it's messy. So let's go back to um, Rhino inside and here I'll choose to have it turned off, have the preview of this turned off. Um, but yeah, we, we do get ourselves the shape. You can see that Revit really doesn't like curved things. <laughs> well, it is what it is. Um, so it has trouble uh, drawing it. Let's see, realistic. Yeah, realistic seems to be fine. Seems to be doing just fine. <clears throat> so we, we, can, we can draw it um, this way. Add BREP, direct shape. Um, I can also, oh yeah, once you delete it, this uh, Revit starts complaining, Rhino inside elements are no longer tracked because they have just been deleted and kind of even shows you which elements. So we can choose to delete all and they're gone in Revit as well. Uh, back here, build, or sorry, direct shape, uh, I can choose add geometry, direct shape, and this uh, node right here gives me more options. It, give, it enables me to give it a name, it enables me to give it a category, what's the geometry and what's the material for the geometry. Uh, let me quickly guide you through the process. The name is literally just a panel, so slash slash, or you can type in panel, and give it a name, um, snail, whatever, like that, that's a name. Then category, well for category you do need to go to direct shape categories, right here. Like that. Um, and then you connect. And you can kind of search, so I'm just gonna say generic model. Generic models, there we go. We're, we're just gonna use that as a category. Uh, you can do whatever. You can see that this snail is actually a pipe. pipe a, a pipe fitting if you want to, right? So you decide yourself what the category is. But I will be using a generic model. There we go. Then for geometry, of course, the geometry is just the geometry. Like that, easy. And then for the material, the material is the interesting part. Um, if I remember correctly, and let me expand this because this will um, require me to dive into the material tab right here. Uh, in the material tab, there is this uh, convert material. Quickly create a new Revit material from shader or color. So I can just say convert material. I can use this. That's going to be our material. And for the shader, I will just say give me a color swatch color swatch like that and let me minimize this so that you can see how it changes when I connect and let's just connect color swatch to the material uh, doesn't look great I think it might be because why 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 red hmm that's weird consistent colors okay so the realistic material doesn't like it but the uh, consistent colors material uh, or not material shading preview does does like it so here I can just change whatever color for different objects I want sorry about that by the way if I were to um, change the alpha here it also changes it here so you can make it transparent which is nice okay this is not necessary to do right now. This was just for me to explain to you what we're going to be using in the future so that there is a little bit more of a um, Revit-based information here. It's not just Grasshopper, but I am deleting it. Delete all. 
and we're just sticking to by the way if it, uh, we're just thinking to grasshopper for now if you have um how is it called like this gradient the wide gradient around just go back into revit and then back into grasshopper just click on revit grasshopper and it's going to be uh, gone uh, usually it happens when revit requires some sort of information from you and you just saying yeah i'm looking at you okay good and then coming back to grasshopper either way back here let's look at rhino ma'am in rhino i want to create floor slabs for this particular geometry i could make floor slabs just um like as sections as geometry itself but fortunately there are under build there is add floor option given its outline curve it adds a floor element to the active revit document perfect that's what i want add floor bam uh what does it want from us boundary curve okay we'll need to get that somehow type what what's the type of the floor okay uh we can actually right click on the t and choose you know what what the um what's gonna be the type uh then the level to which it should be added so we need to create levels first that's important and then the last one is is it structural is it true or no right so in our case nothing is gonna be structural it's only going to be like um a quick quick and dirty model N nothing too fancy so first things first is we need the boundary curves well how do we get the boundary or, or sorry first things first we need the levels we need to know we need to know at which level it's going to uh need to cut the floor slabs at right so how do we create levels well first thing is actually creating them in revit second thing is creating them in rhino or grasshopper and we're going to be creating them in grasshopper of course um back here i need to this is so many things is is it under build no annotation definitely not model add level there we go under model add level right here asks us for level elevation name and level type okay so we need to give it an elevation you know what's what's the the, the height and uh, what's the name of the level and what's the type of the level is there any other things that we could use one second no we are we are doing it this way yes okay so add level elevation if i were to say elevation is going to be 5000 millimeters bam and then the name of the level is going to be um my test level slash slash is very useful but if if you can't use slash slash just type in panel nope not that one panel the orange one double click on it and type in you know my test level oops don't don't hit enter just click outside if you hit enter it's gonna complain so my test level same thing right um it it does create a level here right and it does create a single uh a single level if i go back in here and i zoom in you can see that in revit uh, my test level has been indeed created um so for levels we will need more than one right so we, i need to decide where we actually create our our levels uh right Oh, it, it even makes a nice little dashed line. That's nice. That's nice. So I'm going to, instead of one slider, I'm going to use more than one. 
uh, and I'm going to merge all of them with uh, into one list with a merge command, like so. Merge will connect to our elevations, and our first elevation is going to be zero. Naturally. And for the names, I will need to redo this as well, so let me delete that. So, uh, first elevation, or first level, is zero. Second level is going to be... Um, this is at six, right? So I think there should be one below... No, let's do second one is going to be at 6,000 uh, and a half. 6,500. So pretty damn high. Then next one is going to be at like... Let's just see. Uh, 6,500 goes here. And then the next one would be plus 4,000, plus 4 meters, so 10,500, right? That's 4 meters. And it kind of gets a little bit funky there. Which is actually fine. Okay, 4,500, sure. Bam. Nope, 10,500. I'm stupid. <laughs> There we go, 10,500. So we have three different levels. Now we need three different names. We will be using a merge and we'll be creating a panel. And in the panel, I'm going to say, um, level dash one, level dash two, level dash three the reason why i use dash is because by default revit uses uh just level two level one without a dash and i need to know uh, i need to have them separate separated uh, so that i know which ones to delete right uh so that uh actually we don't need the merge right because we're writing everything in one panel so sorry about that we don't need the merge we just can directly connect it and it's going to complain <clears throat> when whenever it complains click on this top right corner icon which will tell you what the problem is rhino inside revit grasshopper name cannot include prohibited characters All right, I guess it's the dash. So let's just say level zero one, level zero two, level zero three. Okay, still complaining. Right on side road, name cannot include prohibited characters. At this point, I don't think it was the dash. It might just be the fact that we're using three lines. So I'm going to right click on this and I'll choose multi-line data. Uh, this one to force it into separate lines and now it's happy and now we can see that the, all of the levels transfer and we are kind of good to go so with here let's minimize this and i know this part of the tutorial is not that sexy but it's it's important so with here uh, being here we will get rid of level two and level one Level 1 will also say that yo, your site plan as well as your level 1 will be deleted. I'm okay with that. Because now we will be able to create um, plans or plan views from these three levels that we have here. Um, if you want to, you can create them directly in Grasshopper by just choosing... Uh, Model view, come on, come on, it's it's here, view, there we go, view, add floor plan, this one, add floor plan, it asks us for, okay, what's the level in which you want to add the floor plan, we have the levels, and it asks us for, give me the view name, guess what we're doing, we're just taking the, well, we can actually just do this, like that, it's gonna be, 
same level and same floor plan name are gonna be used. And if I were to check, check it out right now, floor plans, I have three floor plans right here, ready to go. So we're controlling everything with Grasshopper. So this whole part right here, we just can uh, group this all up and call this levels slash plans. There we go. We have our little group and feels like it should be here in the top like so oh, almost there okay add floor boundary type level struck is it structural okay so structural i can immediately give it a toggle boolean toggle false no it's not structural level we have levels i can just add level this one the, the the output of this i just connect them here easy third one type uh, we ignore for now first one boundary we need to get a boundary how do we get the boundary well we look at the delete that Oh wait, that was a mistake. We need one more level. Or oh, actually, this is a good good uh, moment to kind of show you how you just add one more. So here you just expand uh, one more input for the merge. And I just create a new slider saying 14,500. Connect it. It's going to complain here, but that's fine because I just double click on the panel and type in level 04. All right, one more dashed line. Nothing is complaining. Everyone's happy. Back in Revit, back in Revit, back in Revit. There we go. Level 4 is created. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All right, so ba back in here at floor, we have our. Um, boundaries right uh where's our oh there there's our rhino we want to slice through our shape this b rep at these heights how do we do that well i could use or i should use a boundary no not boundary how is it uh intersect tab mathematical B rep plane intersections. Solve intersection events for a B rep and a plane otherwise known as a section. Duh. So we're going to be using that. Base B rep, that's going to be our B rep. And the plane, well, that's a little bit more problematic. For the plane, we know for a fact that it's going to be an XY plane, right? Because it's flat on, on the ground, right? So it's going to be XY plane, like so. But the altitude of the plane is actually going to be controlled through these, um, through the heights of these panels. Panels? Not panels. Um, sliders of these sliders. So this list of numbers that we get after the merge is going to is, somehow needs to control the height of the plane. How do you do that? Well, you need to construct a point that has the Z value associated with these uh, four numbers. So just merge connects to the Z like so. You can see it just kind of makes four points then let me zoom into them if you connect your four points to the planes to the plane o, o, o input and zoom in somehow well trust me on this or actually don't trust me on this let me make this visible there we go by the way i just made the planes bigger by just going to display preview plane size 3000 um, now each of the, these points has a plane in it and the planes are infinite in size, right? So you can make, uh, you can choose to do, um, section, 
uh, through your BREP with these planes and they generate these outlines. Let me hide the BREP <clears throat> and the planes and let's actually take these construction curves, create a new layer in the Rhino, uh, say shape construction curve CRV, uh, move them down, change object layer and hide that layer just so that it's not in the way. And you can see that we get one, two, three planes here. The problem is that the first plane is kind of, um, it's just generating a single line, right? And that usually happens when things are kind of touching perfectly and aligning perfectly. I think if our level one was not at zero, but rather at let's say 120 millimeters yeah it gets solved right so our uh, level one is actually at 100 millimeters rather at uh, 100 millimeter altitude rather than zero so we get our curves and this is the moment where we do need to save so make sure to uh, your grasshopper file first of all repeat after me <laughs> grasshopper file save document and you just name uh, Rhino Inside Revit Course. Save. Then Rhino file. File. Save as. Uh, same folder. Wherever you want it to be saved. Uh, Rhino Inside Revit Course. Okay, now Revit also, let's try, there we go, Revit, file, save as, a project, or, or just save the project, same folder, mm, where is it, there we go, uh, Rhino inside Revit save okay everything is saved the reason why i'm saving it is because the sections are they contain curved lines and curved lines tend to break revit really really quickly um so we need to make sure that everything is kind of saved before we uh before we do this we take the curves the c output and we connect it to the boundary input here It's crashing. <laughs> uh, it can't handle the freaking four curves. Oh, I think it's, yeah, it's alive. It's alive. Uh, let's take a gander <laughs> at how it represents the floor slabs here in Grasshopper. That's not pretty. It does do a pretty decent job in Revit. But we know for a fact that this is broken, right? This this is just a mess. So we need to somehow make it better. Okay, how do we make it better? Well, let's disconnect. Uh, I disconnect by holding control and moving it backwards. And instead for the curves, we will be um, exploding, not exploding, sorry. Uh, dividing, not dividing, rebuilding. I'll get there. Oh wait, sorry. Uh, one, one thing. Uh, now when I think about it, let me test this out. No. Yeah, it just freaks out. So we are going to be uh, rebuilding this. No, we're going to get all of the discontinuities of these curves, right? Uh, um let's let's uh let's see we could use this continuities and split the curves apart and so on but i think it's better to just explode them explode the curves into separate segments so we have a bunch of separate segments each segment gets um 
divided the white curve each segment gets divided by let's say 10 points doesn't doesn't re really matter you can use uh, divide length by the way if you want to but i i prefer to just use uh, regular divide curve like that number of divisions let's do 11 like that so you can control how dense uh, how dense it's gonna be maybe something closer to nine would do the trick uh, then we get a bunch of points and we will be creating a polyline polyline through these points like so so we end up having a lot of polylines many many polylines so i'm going to join them up back into four closed polylines and to do that i need to first of all have them all in one big happy family one big list because currently they're in their own little separate data branch so to do that i will just right click and choose to flatten don't worry about this not a grasshopper tutorial don't forget and i will use join curves uh, to join them up and whenever it can join curves, it's going to join curves. So it just kind of gives me four follow lines, which I then can connect here. And it's complaining again. Hmm. That is weird. Let me check one thing. Graft. That was a mistake. And graft this. that actually works okay so uh, what you need to do you don't don't follow along right now uh, let, let's disconnect this so remember when you have your levels that are going in into the level input here well be, uh, before you connect this you need to right click that level um, input and you need to choose graft which makes it so that each level gets placed in its own little data branch and is waiting for a corresponding curve to work with it. So every level will work separately and not in a single list, if that makes sense. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, you just need to grab this. Don't worry about it. It would be just so much of an explanation to try and teach you the data tree structure of Grasshopper uh, within this course. So we're skipping over it. Uh, same thing for the boundary. You right click on the boundary input and you choose to graft. Then you take the cur curves and you connect that to the boundary. And I think that's it. Now we have... Uh, this is, by the way, complaining just because... It says line in sketch is slightly off axis and may cause inaccuracies. That is fine. It doesn't like that things are um, not 90 degrees. That's Revit for you. Uh, back in here, we have ourselves the floor slabs. And they look quite nice, honestly. So I'm, I'm happy with this. We have made a parametric model that is able, where, where we're able to, if I change this to 5, you can see that it automatically updates everything. Right? Um, so we can control the floor slabs with it. Let's just group this all. Oh, right. The type. I forgot. The type of the floor slab. If you right click the T and you choose a category filter, you say uh, floors floors and for the family filter you can choose floor and here you can choose what kind of a floor slab would you um would you like to use a uh, concrete commercial concrete domestic blah 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 so i'm just gonna say concrete commercial just like that oh this even now likes it more sure <laughs> whatever but uh, we just choose the type and now you can see that the floor slabs uh, have a certain type associated with it how cool is that okay let's group 
Um, at which point do we group this up? I feel like we group this up pretty early on. To something like this, maybe. Mm, give me a second. Now, let's just do it this way. This one, group it up, right click, floor, slabs. Okay, I think I think that's gonna be it for um, for today. We have created our outer form that is currently only in Rhino. Um, I can easily show it to you by changing this to shaded and displaying to you uh, it to you this way. But we do have our form here, and we have our floor slabs. How much time do we have? Let's just give me a second. Or actually, let's do one more. Let's do one more thing. Let's do a column grid, and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll be we'll be finishing up. Because, you know, every every building like this needs a column grid. Um, and making it in Revit is going uh, would be would be pretty difficult. So let's make it in Rhino. To do this, um, maximize that. Back in Rhino. Don't need to look at that. Uh, we can actually hide that. There we go second okay columns 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 so wherever we have revit revit there we go uh under build there is add uh structural column this one right here you could just kind of use your own columns if you want to and just use direct shape add geometry direct shape but i'll be using add structural column this one will be faster uh for the um to to create it it asks you for a axis line asks you for a type asks you for a base level and for top level okay okay so we have our levels the list of levels right here let me somehow, can I just say level, right, like so, and I'll just connect my levels to, to here so, so that I can drag, drag it out uh, in, in a clean way so that it's not so messy. So our levels are here and it's, it's basically like a, 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 a list of, of, of our levels. The, four, the list of four levels that we have. So I want to kind of separate it out and I can do that with list item, list item, connect the levels to the L input like so, and it gives you the first level, right? Then if I zoom in and click the plus sign, it gives me plus one, which is the next level, second level, plus two, one more level, plus three, one more level. It gives me now all four levels in separate outputs. That is important. To be able to create the grid for the um, for the first curve, hmm. how do I how do I talk about this? How do I talk about this? Come on, think, think, think. Um, to create a grid of columns for the first line level for the first level. I need to um, specify that my base level is level 1 and my target level or tap top level is level 2, like so, right? And then I need to give it like vertical curve. So just to kind of explain, uh, explain it to you how it works, if I just kind of draw a random line here, reference it in, you don't, don't follow along with this, set 1, bam, like that. Now this is like a, a column thing situation going on. And if I look at Revit, it's somewhere there. 
yeah there, there there it is right so it's it's making a a column if i select it uh, the column is uh, associated with level one and the top of it is level two right just as i uh, made made it clear here so we need to somehow automatically generate a bunch of vertical lines right and a bunch of vertical lines uh, that start at this height and ends at the top of level two or actually slightly below the top of level two to how do we do that well <clears throat> first of all we need in the plan we need to know where they're going to be and the easiest way is well we already have the two curves here but that gets very messy i think because we would have very long wires going out so i'm just going to re-reference our shape curves i'm just going to take the bottom ones the two bottom ones and i'm going to say um curve right click set multiple curves so i'm just ref i have just referenced only the two bottom curves let me hide that so that it's a little bit more visually clear for you and actually maybe i should hide the floor slabs as well so these are the two curves that i have um, referenced then i will make them flat so project onto a plane and the plane for projection is going to be x y like so so these curves are projected onto the x y plane they are flat now then i need to um, somehow create um, somehow figure out how many Okay, let's do this. Divide. Uh, divide curve. Uh, this one. Or, or both of them, rather. Uh, divide both of them. And this is like um, the a, a fixed step size, right? So it's number of segments equals 10. So we have in total 11 points. Don't worry about it, why it's 11. But it is 11 points. Um, and then we can change it uh, we can change the amount by changing the count number from uh, 10 to something else it's going to always give you one extra point at the end right because it's basically 10 segments not 10 points that you're giving it here so let's say uh, 12 something like that as i remember we used 80 meters length for the building so 80 meters if if i were to use count 10 this would be a gap between the uh, between the columns would be 10 meters which is a little bit on the big side um i mean it's fine it it, it would work but I'm thinking, like, let, let's make it a little bit less. So, 11 segments in total, uh, with probably something closer to 9.2, 9.3 meters between the columns. Um, then, since I have the points here, the problem is that if, if I try to connect them like so, like first point with first point, second point with second point, uh, it's not going to, to work out. I need to do one thing, and that is called flip matrix. Don't worry about it. Just flip that matrix. Um, it basically makes it so that uh, first point gets paired up with the first point, second point with the second point, third point with the third point, right? So we get something like this, and then I can use a polyline curve and just draw a bunch of curves through here like so right so we get ourselves um some some lines then these lines i can also divide them divide curve <clears throat> i can divide these lines and i can say um, number of segments let's think mm. So the gap here is 20 meters. Uh, so our 
our curve, the white curve should be, if it's 20 meters, um, three or two. Let's say if it's two, we only get one. No, it needs to be three so that we get two points here for the columns, right? Something like that. And then for the points, uh, we don't need the first one and the last one. So I'm just going to say list item one, two, three. So we are separating out every single point here and we're just getting the first, uh, sorry, the second and the third uh, point from the list. Holding the shift key, by the way, to connect two items into one node, like so. So we have this little defi definition here that takes two curves and it basically just uh, creates you know it, it, it creates as many columns as you want in between um was it 11 a more elegant solution instead of list item here would be to cull index basically remove index and then just creating a panel saying uh, remove index 0 and remove index 1, right clicking the panel, choosing to mul uh, ch uh, multi line data, and connecting it like that. Um, so that if you kind of increase the amount now, it will always just remove the first and the second item of the list. Uh, first and the last item of the list, right? Um, back to 3. Okay, so we have this working, uh, we have the points. Now from the points, we need to draw lines upwards. Okay, SDL, line SDL, uh, start location, direction, and length. Direction is gonna be up, so that's Z. That's easy. Starting location, that's our points, right? That's easy as well. Length, not that easy. Uh, oh, by the way, don't don't need that for structural column. Um, the length is going to be from here, like the data uh, derived from here. So we need to somehow uh, work this out. By the way, what what do we get from here? Nothing that's of use. All right, so I could either make this parametric or I could make this static, meaning I just type in a number right so 2000 so every column is going to be 2000 millimeters high i think we should make it parametric so to do that i will just say numbers so this merge that we have all of the heights in um we kind of borrow the the output of it so the list of our how high our levels are and i'm going to be kind of placing it in the same area where my levels are like so and I'm just gonna say list item as well and I'm just gonna separate them out one two three there we go so level 100 millimeters 6500 10,750 what no 10,500 and uh, 14,500 how high does the column need to be? Well, it's going to be a subtraction where I subtract from 6,500, I subtract the height of level one. Like that. I just pop them in here. Then, well, I'll, I'll show you. There is still one problem with this. Um, I'll, I'll take these lines and I do need to right click the line output and choose to flatten and connect them to the curve input right here add structural column and i believe that is going to be it if i check revit here's all of my columns okay so what are the problems that we are that we currently have well problem number one is all of these columns right here, I don't need them, right? So those need to be somehow removed. And problem number two is that the floor slabs uh, or the columns, they start at zero, zero, zero or zero height. 
in the end... Well, they're kind of offset downwards. And the reason for that is because if I were to check here, um, our starting point position here has Z height of zero. It's not actually starting at level one. So I need my um, the, the, the index, the, the length, um, or not the length, sorry, the position of the points to be overwritten. I can do that by deconstructing deconstructing the points taking and, and reconstructing them construct point x goes to x y goes to y and z well the z is the problematic one right the z needs to be overwritten with the height of level one like that which is 100. I mean, we could just type in 100, I know, but I'm trying to keep everything parametric because, you know, we need to use the strengths of Rhino um, in Rhino inside Revit, or else what's the point? So construct point that connects directly as our starting point, and now we can see they start a little bit higher up. Okay, that part is fine. Now, another one. How do we get rid of, if I show you the floor slabs, or rather the outlines of the floor slabs, how do we get rid of the curves, uh, of, of, of the columns that are outside of this floor slab, that don't stand on this floor slab? Actually, we shouldn't, right? We should have our own little yeah give me a second because if we remove all of these columns then it's a problem with the top layers uh, or top levels because then the columns will just kind of hang on on nothing and they will make no sense uh no sense to have whatsoever so i'm thinking i'm thinking we just need to remove uh these uh, these columns right here and I can do that really really easily by just in the top view drawing around let's say drawing this rectangle and let's just make a new let's just make a new layer and let's just call it remove columns layer and the curve goes in there like that and I can ask uh, where whether or not the points of the columns are inside of the curve or not and if they are inside they should be removed so uh, sorry let's reference it in curve right click set one curve oh, give me a second okay we're back so I have referenced in the curve right here and I know this is getting a little bit complicated, but this is going to be the most grasshopper intensive portion of the um, of the three courses uh, or, or three days, I guess, uh, three videos. Uh, other videos will be much, much less um, grasshopper intensive. It's going to be much more about 3D modeling, uh, which is the fun part. So let's finish it off here. We have a curve and we can say, well, Inside of it, I don't want the points. So before we deconstruct the points, it needs to be right in between here, right? Before we deconstruct the points, I want to ask whether or not in curve, the points are uh, inside of the curve, point in curve. That's the point, that's the curve, like that. The result is going to be yes or no, uh, basically statement. And I can just say cull pattern uh, remove from this list with this pattern, the result, the points. And you can see that unfortunately it removes everything that is outside of the curve and it keeps everything that stays inside of the curve. 
the green points are the ones that are being kept because you know I have this node selected so we need it to be inversed how do you inverse it well you just right click on the pattern input here and you choose to invert and now you have all of the points that are outside and then this curled pattern gets deconstructed and reconstructed with the new height and then lines are drawn and the columns are made the type of the columns uh, seems to be wonky. Um, I don't like the type of the columns. So I'm just going to right click that. Structural columns. And I'm just going to choose. Columns. Oh my god. It was the first one. Oh, you can't see it. I'm sorry. Uh, one second. There we go. Type. Uh, instead of structural columns, I'm going to choose columns. And for family, I'm just going to say rectangular column. Um, 45.7 mil. Collected type is not on category. Uh, <laughs> structural columns. God damn it. Okay. So this one really wants us to use uh, structural columns. Let's see if there's a column... There is not, that's very weird because there's only a structural column option for creating columns. So we're, we're sticking to it, I think. We're sticking to it. Back to structural columns. Yeah, and we just have a single one, the T, uh, T profile. Either way, we get ourselves our little column grid we look at it here and it connects nicely the problem is that um it intersects here well it's not really a problem but it's uh something that we would want to fix uh later and you can fix it quite easily by just in subtraction just saying okay i'm gonna from this length i'm going to subtract uh 350 mil or something like that right and now they're a little bit below so maybe less and you just find you know like the, the the by how much do you want to offset it downwards but we're not going to be doing that it's it's uh too complex as it is i think let's have it like this okay so that is for um the column grid below right below here then honestly for the remainder of our levels we just uh, we are we should be able to just kind of copy the columns up right uh, to be between level uh, 2 and level 3 and then between level 3 and level 4 because they're not really necessary uh, to what's the word give me a second it's unnecessary to make more columns for those two levels so let's do that uh, one thing that i'm also noticing is that here these two columns right at the start are um, weird uh, the, the placement of them is weird uh, we should start from these so i'm just going to go back in here where we had where we had our divide curve uh, where's our grasshopper? Or sorry, our rhino. Uh, these points, I, I need to remove them. So I'm just going to say list, uh, not list, uh, cull, cull index. Like that. And I think if I just cull um, index, uh, index 0, if I just remove first items from the list, like that, it just gets gets rid of those so call index that helps again if you're not if you don't want to follow along uh, here or if, if you're having trouble um, or if you're just lazy uh, patreon supporters get the files for free so consider supporting the channel so that's fixed and then we just kind of do we just move it 
think we just move it. So add structural column here, uh, adds the columns to the first floor. I'm just going to make another one. Um, build, add structural column. That's going to be for the second floor. So um, it starts here and here. Then we're going to have one last one. Starts here and here. So we have um, curves um, that, that need to be added for, for this area right here this level and curves that need to be added for this level right so here and here how do you get that well you can just kind of take this take these curves uh, line segments or rather no we don't take the line segments we are going to be using the line sdl like that and line sdl like that we're going to be using these but our starting uh, position will change and our length will change, right? Because the columns here will be shorter. Um, the direction will not change. That is going to be direction Z. Double click Z. Oops. Not like that. <laughs> Z. Uh, the, the length will change though. So first of all, uh, the starting position. Okay. Uh, for this level, the starting position needs to be at the height of this level. So wherever we had deconstruct, then here, and deconstruct and reconstruct, I will be copying it two times for um, this level and control V for this level, right? So this level will get uh, de deconstruct, reconstruct, and this level will get deconstruct, reconstruct. Um, the Z for, uh, for this level is going to be, you know, from plus one and Z for this level is going to be in plus two. Sorry, wrong plus two, that plus two, <laughs> like that. It, it's becoming a noodle fiesta, unfortunately, uh, which is hard to read, but just uh, keep in mind, you know, this is altitude 100, this is altitude 6500, this is altitude 10,500. So 100 goes in here and columns are created from there. Uh, then 6500 goes in here. So now we have these points, which means that the columns will be created from here upwards. And then 10,500 comes in here, uh, which means points are created right here and they will go upwards again. So that and that happens. And now for the length, the final thing is we do a subtraction, which is basically just removing. Um, wait, how, how does it work? We need to remove from this height, we need to remove this height and then we will know exactly the length, right? So subtraction from level three, we remove level two, uh, that's level three, we remove level two and we get the length of our columns, bam. And then again, subtraction from level four, we remove level three altitude and we get the length of these columns. Voila. We have ourselves a parametric column grid. It's a mess, I know. But once you kind of start grouping things up, so let, let's actually group, group things up to, to make it a little bit more, um, a little bit more user fr friendly, I guess. So, like that and something like this okay that that and that we have ourselves uh three separate uh levels for the columns we these are just separated out we have ourselves um let's see column 
column loom grid generator in plan and this is uh, column grid uh, level one this is column grid level two and last one column grid level three all right so a, a little bit of a painful painful thing but now as we are kind of in the final stages of this oh this this one also needs to be kind of grouped and let's just say um how do you call this like separate out levels and their altitudes yeah something like that and all of these <clears throat> everything here gets grouped up and we call it columns columns okay move that down here and block it in Ooh, okay let's take a look a final look <clears throat> into Revit this is what we have this is how it looks like I think it looks just fine because <clears throat> we still need you know like the, the the outer outer shape and so on for for everything to kind of look nice let me just quickly add a direct shape um like that you don't need to do this this is just gonna be for the thumbnail of of this uh, video so direct shape geometry like that then uh, swatch color swatch uh, let's just make it transparent and uh, convert convert material like that uh, perhaps actually can we make it more glossy um create material where is the where's the color or diffuse there we go <clears throat> Um, that's gonna be the color and the transparency is gonna be uh, right here so that's gonna be 0.5 and the shininess is gonna be 0.8 hmm that doesn't care <laughs> about it being shiny or not emission or specular yeah so it's hard to make uh, Revit actually show a shiny material. Maybe realistic will do the trick. Realistic for some reason doesn't give you transparency. I don't know why. Shaded? Honestly, shaded seems to be the best. Oh yeah, because consistent colors, right? Uh, that that's a little bit, a little bit worse. Okay, so I think we are. We are done with today's lecture. Uh, let me save all of the files. This is what we have so far. Uh, tomorrow, or not necessarily tomorrow, but in a few days, um, a new video will pop up um, that is going to walk you through um, how you, cr you can create a grasshopper based facade, like a parametric fancy facade around the shell. Um, and then how we can start dealing with glazing in, in certain areas here and there, right? But for now, the way it is, is I think that that looks just great. Um, oops, shouldn't, shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, you can also, ju just to kind of fi finish up for today, if for some reason you want, for instance, this to be inside Revit and disconnected completely from Rhino, then you can select it, go to Rhino inside, 
and choose to release elements. Release elements created and tracked by Grasshopper. You release them. Elements are no longer tracked, uh, which means that you can just take this object and now it's an object just that just exists in Revit, right? So it's it's like its own own little thing, and it's a generic model um, that we yeah we specified. So hope that that kind of helps out. Okay, we're done. We're done. Thank you. Thank you all for watching. And I will see you soon. I will see you in the next one. Later.